Dr. Tallman, who needs uh, certainly no introduction, is going to talk about bone health. Okay. Well, we're going to try to catch up some time and not uh, bother you until you can get on your skis, nevertheless. So, you all are well aware of the clinical problem of prostate cancer and the uh, incidence of bone metastasis in these patients with over 70%. And the impact is also clear. It's an impairment of the quality of life due to important pain and skeletal-related events leading to uh, f fractures that need surgical treatment or spinal cord compression requiring radiotherapy. So, in terms of phenomenology, we have two forms. We have the osteoblastic lesion that you from prostate cancer are well aware of, or we have these osteolytic lesions, and prostate cancer is in the range between osteoblastic and mixed lesions. So, what you find and what we have is that the cancer cells, they interfere with the physiological bone remodeling that's going on uh, anyway. And in the osteoblastic lesion, you have a more deposition of new bone, so you have more bone formation than resorption, and in the osteolytic bone metastases, you have more resorption than formation leading to these lesions. But as you can see here on this bone scan, you can also have plastic lesions beside pure uh, lytic lesions. So, how can we look at bone health? We have a lot of bone markers, but very few are validated, and probably only bone alkaline phosphatase has stood the test of time, and it's often a little bit forgotten, but you can use it in the, in the case of treating patients with hormonal treatment, because if you look at this uh, study from Rob Pelger from Leiden, you can see that if you have a normal alkaline phosphatase prior to undergoing orchiectomy, you have a better overall survival than, or progression-free survival than if you have higher levels of alkaline phosphatase. And even more predictive is if you do the alkaline phosphatase one month after orchiectomy, because then those who do not have a flare or only a slight reaction of the alkaline phosphatase they have a better survival. So you have a better prediction and you have a better indicator of where and when and whom you should treat. Because, as I will show you later, hormonal treatment activates bone resorption or bone uh, or, uh, activity. So, <laughs> in this large study with over uh, 20,000 patients, you can see that 12% of patients will undergo to the, have a fracture with uh, under hormonal treatment with uh, prostate cancer, and these are 100% more if you treat them with androgen deprivation therapy. Also, the number of fractures increases about 50%. So this is a, an issue anyway, and you can use different treatments to prevent these changes. If you look here at the bone mineral density of patients with LHRH agonists, you can clearly see that the patients who receive agonists have a lower, have a large change in the lumbar spine and the total hip of their bone mineral density, and this will lead ultimately to more skeletal-related effects. So, if you could, and this is even more so if you have long-term androgen deprivation, as you can see here, the patients in the violet curve have had more than one year uh, LHRH agonist treatment, so the proportion of fractures increases in these patients, and we have to bear this in mind when we initiate treatment with uh, LHRH agonist or orchiectomy. Furthermore, we have options how to, what to do, and we can use is in the older study from 2007 with alendronate. Alendronate inhibits or antis. Uh, antagonizes some of the bone change at uh, bone turnover, and we have less changes in the bone mineral density in these patients. This is also true for solidronic acid, as you can see in this study by Smith. So, in, if you start hormonal treatment in patients, why not look at their bone mineral density do, if you have a suspicion that there are other clinical indications of uh, a danger of bone uh, osteoporosis or slider bone mineral density, then these patients might profit of some uh, bisphosphonate or now newer, the denosumab, which we'll talk of later. Now, as I already uh, insinuated a little bit, androgen blockade increases bone turnover, and one of the questions that might come up is, what happens? You have here a bone and a bone marrow schematically, and you have here some tumor cell batches. If you turn on bone turnover, the chance that one of these 
uh, batches of, of tumor cells or micrometastases might fall onto one of these active uh, bone morphological units, then these release, as you know, the osteoclasts release growth factors. This may even turn on uh, uh, metastasis and bone uh, metastasis <laughs> formation. Many years ago, we, in a, an experimental model, we already showed that, that if you take intact and castrated hosts and you inject tumor cells that are bone metastatic into these animals, then interestingly in the castrated population we had more animals with paraplegia indicating that more animals developed bone metastasis than in the normal uh, or in the other population which was what, much lower. So given this we also looked at the, uh, the option could we use bisphosphonates in a preventive manner and as you can see here using optical imaging where you can quantify the tumor load, you see that in, the, in black the animals that were injected prior to inoculation with tumor cells had a lower tumor formation and lower number of tumors growing over time. Whereas if you injected the, uh, the cells, the tumor cells up front and the animals de developed bone metastases, then we had a, and then started treatment with bisphosphonates, then as you can see here, there was no big difference and the tumors developed very rapidly with these aggressive cell lines. So this opted is one of the questions that the ZEUS study is looking up at that the AUA initiated with solidronic acid to see can we prevent and we're waiting for the results of this large trial to be sufficiently mature. Do we have indications in another way? of a potential preventive aspect. Well, yes, we have the MRC trials, PRO5, using clodronate versus placebo in, in patients with metastatic disease, and these all had uh, uh, hormonal treatment. And in terms of symptomatic progression, bone progression-free survival, there was no difference. The only difference in the er first report in 2003 is that the patients under clodronate did better in terms of WHO uh, performance status. Now, in the other trial they did, quadrinate versus uh, placebo, but this time in non-metastatic uh, patients, there was no significant difference between uh, the two arms in terms of symptomatic bone progression-free survival. However, not everybody in this trial had hormonal treatment, not, some had only radiotherapy, so it is a mixed pickle, so maybe and not that many, not, maybe not sufficiently powered to find out the difference. But nevertheless, there was. In terms of survival, now in the last uh, report in the Lancet Oncology 2009, then we find that in the metastatic patients, there is an advantage in survival over time in these patients going about eight to 10 months in the patients with metastatic disease. Again, in the patient with localized and <coughs> advanced disease, there was no big difference and no significant difference in overall survival. So there might be something, there might be a population that might profit of early treatment of bone metastases. Here, just in this forest plot, the important things, patients with high alkaline phosphatase did better with clodronate, uh, high creatinine, don't ask me why, did better, and those with, uh, who had a poorer uh, performance status also fared better with clodronate, but in the end, what it burns down to in terms of uh, survival, the, fa the favorable was only in patients with metastatic disease who were under hormonal treatment. Time to first skeletal related events, if we treat patients with uh, bisphosphonates, then solidronic acid fared better than placebo in this study, and it was a clear difference if you look at the median survival without uh, skeletal related events, which was significant. Important thing, because it's not only the events, it's also the pain, and after three months of uh, treatment, the patients on solidronic acid had bit much better uh, pain scores than the placebo group and this still remained over time but as you see over time nevertheless despite treatment for bone uh, disease there were pain uh, episodes that and a pain scale of higher magnitude rising. So let's come to the last one that is rank ligand. If you look at the vicious cycle of bone metastases it's far more complex than 
we probably anticipated initially because it is a, a vicious cycle of factors being secreted by the tumor cells that may activate directly or inhibit the osteoblast that may activate a rank ligand which then activates the precursor cells that then develop into osteoclasts which release growth factors and other things that again might activate these and then you have a nice vicious circle that you all well are aware of. And rank ligand has an important in, uh, uh, place in this whole story and that is why there was the intention to look can we treat this. And in this process that we call the coupling process, the osteoblasts because this is normal bone formation actually, you have the osteoblasts that secrete the rank ligand which then binds to the rank, its ligand, uh, its receptor and activates these precursor cells to become osteoclasts which then will activate and uh, release and work, uh, abrade the bone. Now this is normal because afterwards the osteoblast will move in and fill in this gap with new bone. But what happens here is these cells release more factors, activate the tumor cells and we have this vicious cycle. So the idea was we take antibodies to this and with these antibodies we block the activation of the, these precursors and they do not form, uh, become osteoclasts and with that we have an apoptosis of these cells and we have less release of these factors and due to this release we might even be able to inhibit some of this activation. So far so good. How does it look in real life? There was the first study by, uh, reported just recently by Smith in The Lancet, which is a phase three trial, randomized placebo <coughs> controlled of denosumab against placebo. There were 1,400 patients evenly distributed, also in terms of patient selection. They were well uh, balanced, the two groups. And in a nutshell, denosumab significantly increased uh, bone metastasis-free survival by a median of 4.2 months compared to a placebo, the nozumab significantly delayed time to first bone metastasis by 3.7 months and also time to symptomatic bone progression. However, overall survival did not differ between the two groups. The rates of uh, serious adverse events were comparable in both groups. One point which everybody is concerned about in uh, working with the solidronic acid or also with uh, the nozumab is the percentage of ONJ that developed 5% of the patients in the denosumab developed uh, an ONJ and 2% had a uh, hypocalcemia. But there's a significant impact and that is what is important for these patients. Then there was a trial looking at denosumab versus uh, zoledronic acid uh, by Fizazi and if you look at this group of patients, then you can see there is a slight difference in favor of the nozumab of about three to four months. And however, in times of first on study, serious uh, skeletal related event. And if you take the second one, because there might be a, diff a slight imbalance in the two, then nevertheless, it's still stronger and there are less uh, skeletal related events with the nozumab in these patients. So, Overall survival, time to disease progression did not differ. Side effects, which is always, and safety, which is an important issue. The only things there was a significant difference between the two groups was fatigue. Then CTC grade four, three and four events were about 8% higher in the denosumab group. And there was twice as much uh, hypocalcemia in the denosumab uh, population. This might be due to a better activity in this context but that still needs to be kept in mind. ONJ did not necessarily, uh, not a big difference, or it was not significantly different. And what is another thing that a lot of people were worried about looking at denosumab is the rate of infections. Uh, denosumab works on uh, rank ligand and NF-kappa-B is an important inflammatory cytokine and involved in infections. So if you inhibit this, there was some worry about infections, but there was no difference in infections in the two groups. So in conclusion, if you start, bone health starts when you start considering androgen deprivation therapy. Think about the moment you do it, should this patient eventually need uh, some treatment or prevention for that, that doesn't need to be that much. 
Uh, bisphosphonates can prevent loss of bone mineral density by androgen deprivation therapy and decrease skeletal related events. The rank ligand inhibitor, the nozumab, clearly decreases also skeletal related events, and in this study by Fizazi, more than zoledronic acid. And whether we really be able to prevent bone metastasis one day is still an open question. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we have some time for questions. Um, any, uh, anyone in the audience? You mentioned the Zeus trial comparing zoledronic acid and placebo in high-risk patients to prevent bone meds. This trial is over now for many, many years, and we were actually also participating in this trial, and I haven't heard any results. Were there too many events, or what's the story? Well, the story is, is still open. And uh, when the data was looked at, uh, there were not sufficient events to, to really be sure. And if you look at the, MRC, the story of the MRC trials, I think it's a question of time, nevertheless, in this population. And then we'll see if there is a difference between. But maybe it will, the difference is not as high as expected. And I think that might be one of the reasons why they will be waiting for longer time okay, results. Then I have a second question. What do you think is a reasonable numbers needed to treat for zoledronic or denosumab? How many patients do we have to treat to prevent one event? Oh, <laughs> mm. I leave that question to the statisticians. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it'll burn down again to the same question. Can we afford to treat everybody or do we have to be selective? And I've becoming more and more uh, doing a bone scan or a bone mineral density on some of these patients. If I see that he has a high-risk cancer, he's uh, uh, liable to develop bone metastases, and uh, yeah, he's, he's no positive. So if he's younger, I'll take it into consideration, especially if, if I start uh, hormonal treatment at one point in time, because we know that it turns on bone mineral bone turnover, and bone turnover is not only for osteoporosis a problem, but also eventually for the tumor activation in bone metastasis. And so there, I would start treating them upfront before uh, doing that. You prevent osteoporosis, and eventually you do something against his meds. Okay. okay. Um, George, can okay. you also let me know, if you start hormonal treatment, do you give all your patients calcium and vitamin D, and what those, because that would be cheap, very cheap, and I think that it's a good established um, therapy against osteoporosis as well. And when do you really start with the bisphosphonate or the denuzumab, and do you always do your um, bone mineral density scan, because that's very expensive and insurances don't pay for it? Uh, no, their cost is, is an issue again, and uh, that's why. But if I start hormonal treatment, I give them upfront uh, a bisphosphonate. I mean, the ideal thing would be to give them an oral bisphosphonate that they can swallow because it doesn't need to be IV necessarily, or maybe now denosumab might be a better choice. But uh, I would treat them immediately because that way you block some of it, especially if they have high risk, you stand a fair chance of inhibiting some. But we still have to wait for the real preventive proof. The evidence-based medicine will be certainly no ones. No, no, you can give them, oh, then you give them also calcium and vitamin Everybody. D with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, for everyday practice, it's um, important, I think, to distinguish between bone mineral density loss in patients who just are on LHR agonists and patients who have bone metastasis. And um, patients with bone metastasis can be hormone sensitive or castration resistant. How do you use um, bisphosphonates or denosumab in these different groups then? Okay, when they're symptomatic. I mean, the, the problem is this is that all these treatments are costly, and I think just to, to treat, uh, if you have a, a bone metastasis on the bone scan and you do a, a CT, you see it's going to be liable to break uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the cortical bone, then it will be sooner or later a, a case with a serious, uh, with a skeletal related event, and then I would start treating him. But it's really on a on-demand basis. If he just has a small, bone met somewhere, I would not treat them necessarily. Okay, thank you, Lee So I think for the sake of time, we'll move on to the last three.